Enough of that. We'll get back to the cartoons. Bob and Sodi are here now. So this session is for filmmakers. Now, I know there are a lot of you who would like to sit in on it, but it's designed to be a session for filmmakers. So anybody here who's a filmmaker can get up and go out and move upstairs. You'll go upstairs. I'll go back up here and run more film. And you have a good session with Bob. Okay? Sit down on the floor here in front of the girls and you put your head back. Yeah, that sounds like a movie. No. Born to organize, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to get something for your money. <laughs> Exactly sure what we're doing today, but I imagine you can tell me. You want to discuss some things that I might know about, or you, you had said something about to start off with about Spike Jones. I'm curious about the whole connection. I see so much music in all of the cartoons, and I noticed I, have, I first became aware through some research of Spike Jones that a lot of his people have ended up doing cartoons. cartoons. <laughs> Frederick Gass is, I think, working for Hannah Barbera. You mentioned uh, Freddie Ed, Morgan. Freddie Morgan, Eddie Brown. Yeah. And you recorded Joe Rock? You, Joe Rock, too? You recorded Yeah, that. I just did yeah. an interview with him because I played him. Yeah, right. But uh, Joe Syracuse, I think, is doing uh, That's right. soundtracks. But all of, uh, so many of these cartoons are based on, uh, I see the waltzes and uh, the hot jazz yeah. bands and all that sort of thing. And I'm just curious about well, why the connection. How many of you are aware of Spike Jones and his music? Oh, yeah. oh you do, yeah, sure. that's good. Well, the, the, the interesting thing is, is that Spike Jones, when I met him, told me that cartoons were his inspiration for, for much of what he did. Of course, he started off, you knew that, yeah. Start, he started off uh, imitating uh, Freddie, Freddie somebody who snickled Fritz Band. Freddie Fisher. Freddie Fisher, he snickled Fritz Band, yeah. Fred Rockley from. Right. So he started off somewhat based on that, but then he, he really took in a lot of the sound effects and the tempos and the type of things, little breaks that we did in cartoons. And then, of course, he went on and did something so good that a little later we were, uh, in a sense, uh, taking some ideas from him. But I knew him quite well. We were in Honolulu together, and Spike Jones was going to be the best man at my wedding. We, we flew everybody to Mexico City, uh, the family and the friends, to get married, so did I. And he was the best man. It was all in the paper, Spike Jones' best man. And he got back late from the tour. He was on a tour and flew in with the flu. And, and he was pretty sick, so I said, you better stay in bed, but otherwise he would have been the best man. <laughs> a lot of that pace for the cartoon stuff came from the same things in his show. He was, yeah. And when I was doing my puppet shows, uh, uh, he would come over and be on them with me. And then we would go out afterwards, and he was very funny. Spike Jones, he'd sit and tell you stories with a serious deadpan face, and just one after the other, and he just had everybody in hysterics. You know, he never showed that really on the uh, on television, but, but backstage he was very humorous. But does that give you a little bit? Yeah, that's it, but you know, it's still a whole musical thing. Did you, did you people think in terms of music when you were doing cartoons? Was that a primary inspiration for a first start? I always thought in terms of music, yeah. And, 
And of course, you know, that early cartoons like the first Mickey Mouse with a like, boom, wham, bang, that's, that basically is what Spike did later. Yeah, so we, we really carried a bit of that out all through. And uh, in tonight's show, I was just going to show just a tiny bit about Carl Stallings and, and the way he had those musical puns and the way he caught every little action, you know. He did it so cleverly, so well, that you it doesn't detract or, or take over from you. But if you just sit sometime and just listen to the, to the score or see, be, if you watch a cartoon and just be aware of what he did as against the gags and the characters, you'll find it very interesting. It's not clear to me whether these things were scored totally ahead of time or uh, whether he did the score after the animation was done. Some of the planning was before and the rest of it was after. Yeah. <laughs> the way it would work, and I mentioned this to the, the boys from the Leech Studio the other night, forgive me for repeating a little bit, but, but when I finished the storyboard, I would take it into Carl's room, his music room, where he had the piano that you saw on the slide. And I would act out the story for him, showing the, the, you know, the voices, the movement of it, and so forth. And he would absorb that. Then he would sit down with me, and uh, we would work out the tempos. In other words, from sequence to sequence, we would, he would help me decide on the tempos. We would write that on the storyboard, 212, 48, whatever it would be. But he would also, at that time, suggest music. Sometimes I would already know songs I wanted in spots, and then he would suggest other songs. I might have had in mind, or if not, I'd tell him the type of thing I want, and he would suggest it. So many times in the original storyboard, some of those tunes you'll see the name, the name of the tune on the board, but a lot of the music wasn't. You see, then after we finished the whole picture, then when the the cutting print of the silent picture was ready, then Carl, now all these months later, would come back and sit down with me, and we'd run it, and he would say, "Now what was it we were going to do there?" And I said, "That's where we're going to use this tune and that." And he would re refresh himself, and then, of course, do all the additional little wonderful things to the exposure sheets, you see. So it was fore and aft. Would he sometimes say, when he's looking at your finished cutting print, if I had another second there, uh, this would work better? Or would you sometimes go back and add or, or, or cut out a little bit? Disney's were able to do that. We didn't have the time or budget for that. So once we finished the timing on those exposure sheets, it was a very rare occasion when a a frame would be added or subtracted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then you record the music to fit the animation? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. It is a hard job, but of course, it's all done to, to the bars, to the tempos, and it's all there on the sheets, which are transferred to music sheets. So it's, uh, he has on paper to go by, you know, he'll, on his score, he will say four frames blink, you know, uh, or six frames hold, uh, or something hits. That's all the way right to the frame. So you have that stopwatch one minute. No, no. He, his assistant would write that all off the exposure sheet. So he'd look at the music sheets, and that's every little action, and every little action is on there already, exactly what frame to put it comes. You see? So he didn't have to use a stopwatch. I did. To tick tempos. They would, when they came to a sequence of 4, 8, 2, 12, they stopped, they changed the tick tempos, they all had the earphones, and so they go back to the beat. Yeah. After you had gone through it with him and, and broke it down in terms of tempos, would you then go through yourself and time it out in actions and, and break it down in, uh, into some sort of... I mean, that process is not good. Anymore. Well, what I would do before I took it into him, the storyboard, I would have at that point <coughs> had in my mind exactly every little motion where, and where it came. And I would have the story by a stopwatch from start to finish, the exact footage. I would have each scene, each se every little movement timed out. You see? So you'd have to get that all in your mind and carry it through right from start to finish. How long would, it, would that take you to, to break that down? To break it down? Yeah. Would you have that all marked on exposure sheets? And well, you start off just by, by timing it on the board. Yeah. Then, then I would make out the exposure sheets every little frame. I would write, this happens, Six frames later, this happens. Two frames, a foothold. I would mark every bit of that on the, on the exposure sheets, and that's what he took the music from. You see. Would the finished animation vary ever from that? Your uh, no, script? no, no. Because when I, I'm astounded that you could anticipate everything. You had to. You had to. So well, you just uh, you just visualize it right down to uh, every little detail. You see. 
And uh, if we hadn't have done that, you see, it would have all unsprung. <laughs> yeah. Now, there's other ways of working, you see. Disney's would let an animator, he had a funny walk, and he thought he could do something more with it. They let him try it, and they'd look at it, and they'd maybe keep part of it in, you and see. Right. That was nice, too. But the good thing about our system, since we didn't have the time or money to do different, was it just made us, boy, you had to make that decision, and you had to stick to that decision. So you had to make the best possible decision, you see. Well, the thing that is more astounding is that your decisions are so good. I Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Joe? You said last night that you and anybody else, like, when you're working with more than one film, it's like, you know, Yes. Who is organizing all these people together to be at a certain place at a certain time? What about you know some people? Did you get Joe's question? Everybody hear what Joe said? Yeah. Well, there was a production manager who would see that things were rooted from department to department to camera and that type of thing. But basically, it was like this. Here was my room here. And next door to me was Carl Stalling's room with the, the piano and the music. My animators were all in one room, you see. And uh, it was like five animators and their assistants. And then in another room I had my background artist that painted the scene. Said, us? The sound effects for us. For us. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so it was it was very much just like a very closely knit thing. You're in touch with each other. The animators uh, need a scene. They come to you. You give them the scene. Spend a great bit of time acquainting them with the story and 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 the, every little detail of their thing. And as I was telling the fellows, I would take the layouts and as I showed them their actions. I would sketch in these little, very rough exaggerations of stretches and squashes and little facial expressions. And they weren't be, wouldn't be well drawn, but it would be enough that they would get that whole thing in their mind. If they had a suggestion, uh, you know, of something that would improve it, I would welcome that. And, and occasionally we had that, but for the most part, we were just moving along and they would be most anxious just to capture that concept that we had right down there to the frame on the timing, you see. And, and doing the action is good or better than possible. Now, the animators finish theirs, the assistants finish it, goes to pencil test, the pencil test uh, cameraman, some of you know him, Smokey Garner, the little hillbilly guy, and he would come, and he was from the south, you know, and he would come in and to the animator's room when he had new pencil tests. He'd call me and say, hey, we got tests, I go to the test room. And he'd go up there and say, suey, suey, meaning uh, we're going to have pencil tests. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody would come downstairs, and we had a joke. Uh, I had a long stick, and it was written on there, uh, my goosing stick, which was built specially for him. And he was a comedian. He would play to that. You know, if you did something wrong, you were supposed to touch him lightly with the goosing stick. And then he would do a funny act. And all the animators loved that, you see. It was just, uh, and the pointer also could be used on the little screen where we were watching to say, hey, there's a frame missing right there, and come around again, and, you know, that type of thing. Uh, but everything went. So it'd go to pencil test, we'd go, you know, go to the checker, the colors would be put on. They'd come back to me and say, what color is every little thing on that thing? They'd write that in, they'd go to the ink and paint, go to camera. It, uh, everybody just... So the production manager would be in charge of that, say, working on five shows at the same time. You make sure that you're the rooting, the rooting of it, yeah. But what we were talking about last night was that as a director, I would in one day's time or one week's time maybe have to be involved and have the details in mind of five or six shorts in that one week so that you could shift gears from talking about short number one to short number six just on a moment's notice and, and have that all in your mind, you see. That was it. <laughs> 
Well, everybody works differently. In other words, each director works differently. Like, for example, Tex, who I assisted on story for some years, uh, he would usually think up the basic idea himself, and then I would help him gag it, you see? Uh, and I got more in that habit. When I was directing, I did the same thing. Uh, Frizz and Chuck more organized story men, like Mike Maltese, Ted Pierce, and those. And they would say, it's up to you to come up with the idea, or you're in trouble. And then those guys would come up with good ideas, and then they would uh, do a beautiful job of laying it out. Certain people were more story-oriented, story oriented, others were more layout-oriented. It just depended on what, what a person's strengths were, you see. So, uh, as far as story ideas, I remember, for example, Porky and Wacky Land. I saw a little item in the newspaper that had something about uh, the dodo bird, or some extinct, something about the extinct dodo bird, or the, you know, that type of thing. It was a regular little news item. And that was what made me think of the last of the dodo bird death, you see, the Porky and Wacky Land. I remember seeing another item in the newspaper about how silkworms were going to be put out of business by nylon. And that made me think of the little silkworm in Porky's party that, that knitted all the things, whose ears came out and all, all that, remember? <laughs> yeah. So a lot of, in other words, some ideas would come, something from a newspaper, a little thing, and of course like the Warner features, so many of their things, like the gangster, Cagney, and Bogarts, some of those stories came right out of a one-liner in the newspaper, too. So, as a studio, we at Warner's were more oriented to timely things right off the news, you see, where some other studio might do something much more classical. Uh, various places ideas come from, you see, it just, uh, you're thinking all the time, and seeing things, you see movies, you see films, you go to plays, you go to operas, you read classics, and every place you look, you see some little suggestions for ideas. You never have time to use them all, but you take from that thing. Did you ever get a dry spot? A dry spot? Yeah, like, you know, you would have your cartoons, your ideas, and then all of a sudden you just stop for a little while. I don't, I don't remember that. I don't remember that, no. But usually it was just that you had more things than you had room to, to do with. You had a lot of things you'd like to try, but you just didn't have time. Could you talk a bit about the... the uh some of the actual animation that went into your thing. Like, for instance, in Corny Concerto, uh, in some of the in-between of the extremes, um, when the, uh, the mother swan is going berserk, yes. you have incredible distortions where the swan will fill one, the whole screen from where she's going to where she came from right. for a frame. And that would be totally solid, whereas in a cartoon like uh, A Tale of Two Kitties, where you have some of the same kind of distortions, you airbrushed it much more subtly. Were mm -hmm. you just trying out different things there? Or? Well, we were always trying different things. Uh, when I started working on the uh, uh, Mars idea in 1935 and through 36, I became very, I studied a lot of film, just all sorts of film to see how things moved. And I was fascinated to see, for example, on an animation of a fire. We always, in cartoons, it always made the thing follow through. And I saw on film that every every frame of a fire was completely disjointed. It went this way. No continuity. No continuity, for the most part, you see. Or I saw that the human figure didn't move from here to here as you would in between it in a cartoon. Things would be all uh, angled differently, you see. And then we saw the blurs, like if a hand went up to the camera. Well, that would become much uh, enlarged and elongated and airbrushed, as you say, or blurred. And, of course, we couldn't afford airbrushing at all times. So I would have liked to have had airbrush on the corny concerto blurs, you see. But those, now, did you see that? Did you see that by just seeing it full speed, or did you ever study it? I frame, did that frame by frame. frame, by frame. Both of them. Yes. Was your budget lower on corny concerto, where you had to resort to the solid kind of distortion? Well, I, I imagine, I can't remember for sure now, but I think I would have asked for airbrush on that. See, we had an airbrush department, I mean a special effects department under Ace Gamer. And you would indicate for Ace anything in the picture that he might touch up with airbrush or dry brush or, or put in the additional smoke and so forth. And you'd put that on there and sometimes you'd get it and sometimes he didn't have time and uh, it went through just as you saw it. The difference is so stark. Yes. Uh, some of your in-between drawings on, uh, say, uh, an inch in time where the flea is attacking Elmer butting his dog, you would have Elmer scratching, and then he, there would be two single frame in between, which were 
almost totally abstract. Yes. Like them spinning around to a new position. Right. Uh, well, those are the... You, unless you look at them frame by frame, you, you can't even tell. Those are the little things I mentioned that I threw in rough. Yeah. Those stretches, those turns, those are things I roughed in there, you see. And, and so you would give those to the animator at yes. the time? Yes. But I never do them ahead of time. I would... As they sat with me, looking over the scene, was when I would draw it. As I told them, now let's. Right at the, huh? right at the time that you right were talking, talking. Right at the time that they sat with me, and I'm showing them the exposure sheet. I just showed them the story. Now I'm showing them the key layouts that are all nicely detailed. You see, but now saying now what you can do here is you get from here to here by that, or you can do this. I didn't put it as an order. I put it as a suggestion. But usually they made use of that. You see, and drew it better. You know what I'm huh? <laughs> but people say, well, how come this stretch here? How come that, you know, two frames it does this? And I can't tell you. I just did it by uh, instinct as I threw it in there, you see. Sometimes, yeah. So you look, uh, how, you look a lot of films? Uh, well, I've done mostly television commercials for a few years. I've only recently started doing commercials for collecting. Yes. Careful how you talk there. <laughs> You're right. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, the skills that you and a lot of your contemporaries had so uh, quickly developed in the forties are largely uh, neglected, it seems to me, these days. The yeah. way you can see that is either by talking to people like you or looking at the film. There's no need that the, that they shouldn't be used and, and improved on. Oh, yeah. But instead, it's going. Unfortunately, most of it's going the other direction. What's the reason for that? I'll leave that to you, film critics. Oh. <laughs> but uh, is there? When you're making a film for a theater, you're making a film for television. Do you have a, a different audience in mind, or different techniques, or? Uh, Not so much in the animation, as in the uh, story concept, because if you're making for a home screen, in other words, take the Warner cartoons where we use this tremendous. Uh, activity and what they call violence and so forth. Well, that was made because we would make one short that would be seen every so often in the theater with the features. Now, when you see those all compiled one after the other on television now with a child watching it hour after hour, I wouldn't make those for that audience in the same way, you see? And uh, so definitely in a home with a smaller screen, you have a little different feel to the audience. It's just like in a, in a, in a big auditorium. They will cheer a, a bloody thing like a like a boxing match, you know. Uh, you wouldn't want that in your living room. The same thing, you know. You wouldn't react the same to it as uh, as when you've got the mob psychology. Did you ever uh, attend screenings at a theater just to gauge audience reaction? All the time. Yeah. When we finished any cartoon, I would take it and set up a preview at about seven to ten theaters over a weekend, and go up and down Hollywood Boulevard, little theaters, Roman's <laughs> Egyptian. And as I think somebody put in the paper here the other day, I happened to mention it, I would sit, not and look at the screens, I knew it by heart, I would get in the front row and I'd look back <laughs> at the people. And first they, you know, what are you, what are you? <laughs> I told them I got eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> no. But, um, and I'd watch the, the, the audience, you know, and when, when a cartoon wasn't liked and they just looking at it, maybe smile once in a while, a couple little giggles, you know, you would really feel terrible. You know, you're taking their time and they're not really enjoying it. But when they would roar with laughter and, you know, you could just see a building and the eyes would twinkle and they're sitting, you know, you could just see an audience and you get the feel. So as you write the next story, you have kind of a feel of that audience. You're not writing just what you think is funny only, but you're, you're, you're just visualizing them and their reaction to those things, you see. Did you find much variation from audience to audience? Yes. I found that in all these theaters, there would be one down at uh, Redondo Beach, the Fox Redondo, the one on Hermosa Beach the ones on this boulevard, large and small, I would find that the same cartoon in one theater would get a mild reaction with a full house, that theater, each one, one after the other, and you go to the other theater on the boulevard, like the Egyptian, and you would get always the most enthusiastic one, with the same cartoon, just an hour's difference on the same night. And, and it was always the same. You might say, well, though some of those were neighborhood houses that always got the same audience. But it was very interesting. You just got to know your theaters. <laughs> and, of course, the uh, people that performed for audiences that I knew, like Jack Benny and, and Bergen and all those people across the, did shows across country, 
they knew their theaters. They'd go into Chicago, and they know that theater is going to get this kind of thing, you know, and then you go to Detroit, and you're going to get something else. They knew that, and they talk about it. Right, right. What we used to do, we didn't have time to ever change something, but we used that immediate reaction on this film to make better decisions on the one that you just started. You see? And, and same in animation. We couldn't change the animation, but we would say, hey, now right here, the way we did that doesn't come over so good. So when you did something very similar, right away again, you, you would do it better, you see. Um, the business with the censorship that you faced censors always review what you were doing ahead of time or at the storyboard stage? No, they, they were, it might have been that they were supposed to have a script sent into them. Yeah. But of course, one of our scripts wouldn't tell, doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything. They would always have to have somebody look at each film before it went out. Yeah. And had it, before it got the seal. How many cuts in a finished film? Well, there's, there's a cut now, and I don't know just where it, when it took place, but in have any of you seen Baby Bottleneck? Yeah. Well, uh, there's a scene in there in which uh, these babies, baby animals, have been de delivered to the wrong mothers. So, you know, a mother pig is getting a baby alligator. And, and, and there's all these little baby, alligator, uh, baby pigs nursing on her, and the baby alligator with the baby bonnet and the big teeth is trying to get in there, you see, to uh, nurse. And at that time, the Blondie comic strip had a radio show nationally uh, in which they always opened with the announcer saying, eh, eh, don't touch that dial, and then Blondie, boom, 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 boom. So that line was so well known, see? So just as the little baby alligator pushes aside and goes to for the nipple, she turns and says, eh, don't touch that dial. <laughs> they cut, they cut that out. It ends just with, <laughs> see? That's the kind of thing you get cut. <laughs> Interplay. Did he, up, did, he, did he come up with voices sometimes that you would work on, or what was? Did you say, well, "Here's what you have to do," and then he come up with it? Because some of it seems so difficult to execute. Well, the way we worked at Warner's, <coughs> see, when Mel first came with us, he was trying to get into radio. He didn't want to do cartoons. That was the last resort. So when he couldn't get into radio, he came and he made a deal just to come when we when we could use it. He wasn't, you know, at the studio ever. Hardly ever in the cartoon studio. When we had a script finished, we would call Mel and say, hey, Mel, let's record we'll Record Monday morning. But that would be over the hill at Warner's Burbank studio on the soundstage. You see? So the first time he would see the script was just before the recording session, and we'd sit down, give him the script, and have a read-through, and, and discuss it all through, you see? Now, that meant that the majority of cases, Tex Avery and I were talking about this recently, um, to be factual, you know, when Mel tells a, a um, in an interview and they say, how did you get the Porky Pig voice, and he'll say something that will be a good joke for the audience, you know, like, they sent me out to the uh, pig pen and I listened to him snort, and, 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 and the stutter is really a snort. He doesn't mention that another guy had done the stutter voice on Porky three years before he took over. So that's fine, you know, he, he, he isn't worrying about film history, he's worried about, the, you know, a good joke with the audience. But for you guys that are interested in how is it really done, I will tell you, you see? And as Tex was saying, in the story, uh, in the story room, as we wrote the board, figured out how the character talked and so forth, and how, how do you, when we were writing the dialogue, we had to, in most cases, know whether it's a Tweety or whatever, you had to know before you went to the story session how to write those words. And so 95% 90, of the time in the story session, the Texas, myself, the gag men, would be doing very close to what you're going to hear on the screen, on a voice. You see? You don't see? Yeah, I do. And then he would... Just then then he would do a, a wonderful job of plussing. But basically, when we get to the story session, he wouldn't know where the pauses were or where it should be loud or soft, so we would have to guide that, you see? And then he would, he's a marvelous voice man, and, and on occasion, on a secondary character, we wouldn't have a, a character that wasn't a running character, and then we'd, we'd say, have you got, what, do you, what would you have a, 
that maybe would work for the character. Yeah. And he would do a hollow voice or this, and we'd say, hey, that's swell, and that's the way it was, you see. Like a Danny Kaye imitation, where he goes uh, in the book film, or something, I forget the title of yes. it, where he goes into that uh, bebop yes. rap. That was all written out ahead of time. All written out, of course. <laughs> he just came in and... And he, and, he, and he did a great job on it. But uh, on some voices, now let me tell you, on some voices that he didn't do, like when I was starting the, the Abbott Costello idea, well, actually... One of the things that made me think of it was I went to a nightclub and I heard a guy that looked just like Costello, looked like him, that did this perfect Costello. Was and he the guy you used? No, I tried to use him. So I go back to Leon and I say, I'm doing an Abbott Costello picture and I, and I need to hire this guy that does it in the nightclubs good. And he, his thing was he paid a weekly fee to Mel to do all he could, no matter what. So he said, well, let Mel try it. Mel so we call Mel on the phone, and he, he never done when he couldn't do it. See? So Leon says, oh, he could do it, you know. So I got, I, in this case, I got the discs of Abbott and Costello, and I worked with Mel, and we went through it, and listened to it, every little thing where he did. We worked on it, and then he did a beautiful one. See? He did both voices? No, no. He did Costello. Huh? Yeah, and he couldn't do it to start with at all, you see. And, and it's by a little working, uh, he got it. The, uh, the Abbott voice was done by Ted Pierce, one of our gag men. Yes. And, and you'll hear him on a lot of cartoons. You'll hear Ted Pierce on a lot of cartoons. Did you ever do a voice yourself? Uh, yes, I did. But I, I, I tried for the most part to, uh, say, create a voice, and then if there was somebody, that, an actor, that would do it better than me, I would rather they do it, you see. But many times I had the thing pretty close to the final. Who did the voices of the call for us? Were they actually over the time? Originally. We animated it to original track of, of Bogart and McCall. And then... Yeah, but Why that, you but have just used their Because their contract, Bogart's contract with the Warners didn't allow a secondary use like that. So then Warners, after we've got it finished, they come back and say, oh my God, we can't use the Bogart and McCall voice. <laughs> <laughs> so what I had to do was uh, locate two outside voice people uh, and work with them and, and, and then we, we ran the picture and ran the original uh, voice of Bogart in the call, and they listened to it in the thing and did it right after it. We got it, you see. And I'll tell you who did it. It was uh, Dave Siegel uh, Barry, D Dave Barry Siegel, who's now a famous nightclub comedian. Uh, he did it. And Sarah Berner did the call, and she was our great uh, girl voice artist. She also did the Hepburn and Maisie the Ladybird yeah. and so forth, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, huh? Yeah. Like for, if you want to get a character a specific type of vocal accent, say it's a, a, a foreign accent, do you find that it has to be more of an eclectic sound because you don't want to offend any particular ethnic groups? So, I mean, you're striving for, you either strive for a pure dialect or just a eclectic dialect. Well, you see, you were, you were working with these great voice artists who usually had Mel or Sarah, all of them, they had almost standard voices. You know, Mel had a standard Speedy Gonzales type voice that he would use on radio or a French voice or this or that. So they just did those those kind of voices automatically. So if you had, uh, take for example Beaky's mother. You know, I didn't write that as being a, uh, a Greek voice. I, you know, because Beaky's a little Middle Western farm boy, rude kind of a character, you, I had a different voice for her. But Sarah did the voice, and it just wasn't funny. She, the voice she did was not funny or not pleasing. And I, and I didn't like it, so I says, Sarah, what else could you do here? And so she ran through three or four things. And and when she read them in her Greek, she, Greek voice that she used on the Jack Benny show, then everybody in the soundstage would roar with laughter. You know, I think, well, <laughs> you know, so why not? So I put the Greek voice on, but forever, everywhere I go, they say, how come there was a Greek voice on <laughs> Beaky's mother? <see? laughs> then by the second Beaky cartoon, uh, uh, we changed it to Sarah's Italian voice, you know? But in, uh, see, in those days, there was no, there was nothing where the public said, oh, don't use a, an ethnic thing. That was just part of comedy. Years later, they said, my God, you know, you have a Jewish accent there, or this or that, or whatever. Well, how could you have done that? But you, nobody knew that then, you see. <laughs> yes? I'm well, interested in the story. We were talking about this morning behind the Frank Sinatra characterization in the yes. film. But I, 
He was thin and he sang in this very wispy voice, the real dreamy, you know. <laughs> and it really that came from the radio comedians. Even before you'd seen Sinatra, Hope and those on the radio show would make jokes about him being that skinny or needing blood, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rick. Uh, Rick Carson, uh, yes, uh, at MGM, the skunk thing? Yeah, oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm on an iron bond. Yeah, took it to the furthest extreme of it. Well, yeah. Huh? Oh, he sees him. Yeah. Oh, you know, a guy like Frank gets so big that uh, he's not going to be concerned. Sure. I didn't ever hear him say exactly. I, I've been on some TV shows with him, and and we talked about some of that stuff, but I don't remember exactly that. Uh, for example, I made a cartoon called. Uh, called What's Cooking Doc, in which Bugs was imitating different stars. And what I was going to do there was actually, and it was in the Coconut Grove, it was at the awards, the, the Oscar Awards. Did anybody ever see that? Yeah. So in the story, I had the, uh, Mike Sassanoff and I worked on the story, and the, what we had figured was that although Bugs is animated, all the people are in live action. And we were going to shoot new live action, for example, of Bugs doing these impersonations and then going into Sinatra. And then I was going to have these real uh, cute girls do these uh, flops and kicks and falls and you see and swoons. And then the studio at the last minute wouldn't let us shoot new live action, so I had to do it from stock shots, mostly out of uh, David Selznick's uh, A Star Is Born. And <laughs> yeah, and so so anyway, at that time Frank Tashlin, uh, uh, so I had to lose that. That's most part of that sequence because it wasn't funny just uh, because the people were all real in it so I couldn't animate it. So Tashlin said to me, hey Bob, would you mind if I use that Sinatra, all the Sinatra gags you have? And I said, sure Tash, we're good friends. And he made Swooner Crooner out of it. But it was done with chickens. Did you ever see that? Yeah. yeah. And that preceded the one text did And there was a lot of that comedy stuff. Huh? Yes, right. Right, Rick. When you directed first directed a cartoon, had you been up for that time animating scenes on, on other, on other, oh, sure. other directors? Oh, sure. Of course. What exactly was the transition? Did they just come to you one day and say, okay, Bob, you're going to direct a cartoon now? No, I'll tell you, you want to take a minute to tell you how it happened? I don't know how that will be helpful to anybody, but uh, but when I went into cartoons, did you guys see it the other night, what it looked like when I started, the, just a little after that Bosco? Thing. You see, it was pretty crude. And at that time, the story, they didn't have a story department at Orange. It wasn't a gag department. It was just that they would call us back two nights a week, and we'd all sit around after dinner and help gag the stories, you see. So uh, I like this because I had been a kid cartoonist who thought up my own characters, wrote my own stories, and then drew them. And that's why I expected to do an animation, as I told the guys the other night. Uh, when I got there, and they said, no, you don't get to do any of that stuff. You just sit here and do this. I said, I that's not what I want to do, you see. <laughs> what do I have to do? And they said, you have to be a director, you see, in order to be able to think up your own ideas and put them across. So so I said, okay, well, that's what i got to be. And it took me a few years to make it. But, uh, uh, but I took this as an opportunity. These story meetings uh, was a great opportunity because it was the one chance maybe you could suggest something that would actually get on the screen, you see. So the first week I was there, it happened to be that my mother, uh, it was in the, we were having a bad time, and she had to go live with her folks, and I was sleeping in the back porch of somebody's place. And, and I would write her a letter every day from the first day I started at the studio, telling her uh, what happened that day. She kept those letters, and it's invaluable now because I couldn't have remembered it, but here you got those letters, and it tells from morning to night exactly what happened. And in there I told how the second day that I was there, they... they, they flipped some animation I had done just for practice and gave me animation scenes on the first Mary Melody right away, the crowd scenes and the streamers and, you know, things like that. Uh, then, in the first week we were there, they had the story conference for the second Mary Melody, and I suggested a sequence there that was used. And right away, I got the reputation of being a good gag man, just because <laughs> I had this one thing used in the first picture, the second picture. And Schlesinger at that time he always was saying we got to have better humor in our pictures than we were getting. 
And so he was looking for people who had ideas, but he wanted somebody to direct that had the ideas, but also knew how to carry it out. Couldn't just be a, a writer, you see, only. So, so when he left harmonizing, he called my mother and he said, that if I would come with him, he will give me a chance to become a director. And I was like 19, 20, something like that, then, you see, which was a great opportunity, but he, had, he kept track of each guy, what they did particularly better. So I went with Slinger. I was the first one he signed to a contract, and we moved on the Warner lot from the original harmonizing studio in the DeMille building. And when we were there, uh, there was there there was a gag department, but it wasn't functioning that well, and the pictures weren't that funny. So he was really in there enthusing all of us, turn in ideas, turn in characters. You see, they needed it then. So I kept turning in stuff, and I kept turning in stuff, and so uh, I, I I thought of the Porky and Beans thing, and so he was impressed that I thought of a character that got in the picture, and then I turned in a whole story that he used that Frizz directed, and so about that time when Tex came along, and Tex now um, was going to direct the pictures. He hadn't really directed before. And he took me and says, now you know the characters and you're, you're a gag man. I'll put you with text. The two of you can write it. You won't, he won't need another story department, you see. So now I'm a, he called me an assistant director, right? I do the layouts for him, animate some, help him on gags. Now this was a wonderful opportunity, you see, to work with a great guy like Tex. And here we were, we'd go back nights and we'd think up these silly things. A lot of the stuff that you'll see in my pictures later, Texas later, were things that we talked of loosely then. Maybe we're a little, it was a little too wild to try at that time, you see, but, but we, we, right, but we, we were that crazy just in our discussions back at the beginning at Termite Terrace, you see. So then, when it came to, when I, I, I was working with Tex when I worked on the Mars thing at night, and I left the studio to go do the Mars thing, as I told you. It wasn't panning out. I came back. Schlesinger called me back. What will it take? I says, some money, of course, more money. But the only thing I'll really come back is if you will give me direction. You know? And uh, he said, well, all right, I'll give you the next chance. And then what happened was that Iwerks came over and wanted to, of Iwerks, and had a studio that he'd run out of a contract. And I thought I'd been betrayed because suddenly I hear that I... getting closer. Sneaking <laughs> <laughs> up on me. <laughs> Is it going again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next on my lap. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so so I went with Iwerks and uh, about the end of the second picture that he made, they called me in on a Monday morning and said, Hub's leaving, now you're moving into his chair. You know, I knew I was supposed to get the job. I knew it was going to happen. He told uh, Leon told me, I'm going to put you with Hub and then some point you'll you'll take over, but it came suddenly. You know, I'm like God Monday, and already I'm sitting down in Iwerks' chair. And Iwerks, we we really revered him. That sounded like crap, but you know, being the first artist, the animator Mickey Mouse, and all of that, he's really a, gr- a great brain. And I'm sitting in his chair with his stopwatch, and taking over the story that he had just started. You know, and all of his animators, you know, are frowning at me. You know, they can't stand me sitting in Iwerks' chair. It's a great, great spot to make your first, uh, direct your first film. <laughs> Although I, I had before I moved over there directed sequences for that Joey Brown feature that came in. So, so boom. Then I had the unit, and then we moved back to the Warner Sunset lot, and uh, went from there. That was the way it happened. I'm sorry I took so long on that. Yes. I, I read an interview with Tex Avery where he said uh, he had to make a successful comic strip. Yes. Yes. How much of an artist do you have to be? In well, I have I had the copies of that comic strip of Texas, and and they weren't that bad. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't anything sensational yet, but it was it was well enough drawn. That's kind of a kind of a joke, saying I couldn't draw well enough, so I became a director. Right. You know, <laughs> I I wasn't a good enough mayor, so I became president. You know. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I had drawn since I was a kid, mainly cartoons. <clears throat> and then, then when I was 12, I was signed up by the her syndicate. They saw something that I had published in the Times in color. They signed me up, and they gave me a contract to start when I got out of high school. And they had me down on Saturdays and in the summer vacation in the art department at the newspaper with these great artists that uh, were there. There was uh, Robert Day, who later was a New Yorker cartoonist, if you ever remember him. And Webb Smith, who later became a top Disney gag man. Well, these fellows were all sitting there. Philip I, who was a layout director on uh, Snow White and other pictures. Well, they're all here in this art department. Here's this little fat kid with his own desk, you know. And these guys were great. They would show me so many things. And uh, the head of the department would tell me uh, that you must get your own morgues. Every time you see a good picture of a horse or a ship, you cut it out and you save it, you know, to work from. And then he says, now, you don't, you need perspective and you need more, uh, you know, real construction in your figures. And I said, well, I just want to be a cartoonist. He says, no, but you need this too. So they had me go to Otis Art School when I was 12. And I learned to paint with oils and to sculpt and uh, learn perspective and anatomy and all of that, you see, color appreciation. It was a wonderful thing. And at the time, I thought, well, who needs it? But then later... As you get into animation, then little by little, you find that you here and there have use of all those uh, those other uh, facets, you see, that make use of. So you really encourage a kid to take in everything you can. Yeah, and I went down from there. That was the peak. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened, see, when, when, I, when I was just about ready to leave high school and to take this job and had this contract signed by my dad, Suddenly, here comes this great Mickey Mouse thing, and I wanted to be in animation instead now. And I was working on the dolls with Disney, and so I thought, what do I do, you know? So, as it was, I, uh, I first went to Harmonizing and worked on those first few pictures. I wanted to be sure I was going to make it. And then we went down and told the, the head of the examiner about it, and, and they released us from the contract. But, uh, yeah. Yes, Rick? There was, t there was talk of it. We, we talked it up like, hey, why don't we do one? And, uh, but the thing was that every, all our great artists in the place were working day and night to make those 40 shorts a year. And if we had suddenly gone to, uh, to a feature, all the best people would have to go on, on the feature, and who would make the shorts? You see, it was, it, that was the reason we didn't do it. And you saw what happened to Fleischer when they went into the features, and, and they lost the studio, the whole thing conked out, so... Maybe Schlesinger was right on that at that moment. I think we were more talking, Joe, about making one, and I don't think we had ever set on a definite story. It wouldn't at that time have been Porky Pig on Mars or anything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it would most likely have been a classic, you know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, he says that's a good idea. <laughs> I don't want to be pinned down. Not on tape. Yeah. Do you think it would be possible, given the economics of the situation, to produce something that would have a good quality of animation and then have it be able to be used for creative input? I don't know why not. I think, you know, if you've got the real good ideas, I think that maybe some of the young animators, working with somebody that had the real good ideas, could do something as good or better. You know, maybe it wouldn't do it on the first film. You might even think. using minimal animation. Well, you said at the right price. In other words, if you were getting say one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars per seven minutes, there's no reason that it can't be done at least as well as the ones you liked in the past. And it, it be sold. No. Well, I think anything can be sold. It's not easy because they don't want shorts for theaters. You see, they don't want shorts for theaters. And so then it just gets down. What you make a feature picture, it's you know you take the money back you spend on one of those feature pictures, cartoons, and something great could be done with that, with that same amount of money and time. The whole reason the studios had their cartoon department was to provide shorts as packages with the, the feature, wasn't it? To, uh, yes, they would say you have this many uh, X number of cartoons coming a year. Yeah. Yes. At one time, they, it was almost like a lost leader, you see, at one time. It's really sad that that uh, ended. Yes. Because I think that length of cartoon is ideal almost. Right. And, and now, 
Most studios attempt to make a 26 minute thing for a half hour, and it's really difficult, I think, to sustain any kind of story for that length. Well, it takes more of a story than it yeah, does for a short. Yeah, it's not just an incident, right? Yes. What have they stopped? Well, the theaters, the theaters, uh, of course, got into trouble when television started coming in and the audiences that every night went out Tuesday night to the movies. Suddenly, they're not coming out. They're just hey, they're staying home to see Milton Berle or some silly thing. You see, and so the theaters got in trouble. They no longer. If you'll see the figures on box office attendance from the end of World War II to five and ten years later, you won't believe the, the million, drop millions of people drop off, you see. So when that happened, then that pinched all the theaters, and then they would, and then of course there were longer features, and then they would say, well, look, we don't have to give them a short, let's use that seven minutes to get out and sell them popcorn and candy and stuff, you see, and make more money. And it was all that kind of a thinking. And then the shorts weren't, for the most part, getting the reaction from the audience any more than they were a few years earlier, either. You see, the, the, the audience reaction. Uh, at that time, they had seen all these cartoons, and then they, they started seeing the same jokes and the same thing over and over again, and the same thing that happened to silent comedies. If you take some of the later silent comedies by themselves, you say they're great. But if you had just been seeing them, and you see them again, and maybe that's the same old stuff, but... It lost, it lost your cartoon. We just saw today. Uh, the dog is trying to find home instead. That was the beginning of Charlie Dog, yeah. Well, yeah, you you had done one, and I forget the titles on, but the, the same one I saw yesterday, I think it was called the Chuck Jones. Yes. Or later, it was the same right. How do you feel about stuff like that? How do you feel about what? When, when the same idea is used again. The oh, same that's same the way it should. Well, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, see, when those cartoons were made, for a theater, they'd only see it once a year, and so they wouldn't uh, really remember the one before, you see, but uh, we weren't anticipating you'd see them all in one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there a way to copyright a gag? Like, I've seen the uh, Patty Green cartoons where you've got copies of the other Yeah, that's right. Well, word for word, and, and there's no way to Well, there's an old thing, you can't copyright a gag. For example, uh, example, when Tex and I were writing a Porky's Duck Hunt, uh, Tex had a gag that I thought was real funny, and it was where, and I animated it, and where Porky parts the bushes and the duck comes out and honk, honks the guy in the nose, Porky in the nose. Uh, a year or so later, I went to a retrospective with Max Sennett of his films, in which he spoke, and here was a duck hunt picture. And what do you say? Next side of the hundred ports thing, and this dummy duck comes out and honks him on the nose. See, so what are you going to do? Copyright the gag? We couldn't use that. You see, yeah. it's like that. <laughs> in fact, in fact, in uh, another one of Texas, uh, he as a kid evidently grew up on these things, and it was in the back of his mind, like it is with all of us. There's a thing where there's a ditch, and the men are uh, with pickaxes are going out of sight and coming up, and things go over it. We used that in the picture. That was in an early Max Sennett the same night, you see. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. On the average, how long would it take to make a short, say, for Porky and Mikey? Yeah. Well, uh, let's say this. We, we took, from the time we got the idea to the time we got the print back, anywhere from four to six months. The color ones would take six months out of Technicolor. Because you would maybe have say 13 days to, to uh, think of the story idea, write it all, lay it all out, and write the dialogue. You have that many days for that. Then you record, you know, then you plan the music, the animation, the this, the that, down the line. And it would and it would come back in about four months, let's say four or five months to six How months. How many animators would you have working on a single? Usually five. Usually. Usually only one animator credited for the credit. Yes. Is he really mostly no, one? what they did was they rotated it. They put the, the uh, Ray Katz would sit in the office and he had these names all and he'd say, okay, and it comes around now, next it's this guy and then next it's that. You see, and he would make out those credits. How many days would it take to do the actual paper drawings? Well, again, it would be, each department would have about the same. If it took us 13 to 15 days on story, there'd be 15 days to animate it. And it, it, it five yeah. Guys. Huh? Five guys. Five guys. We were, we were real fast, like you see in those things. We go, this is this one. <laughs> <laughs> Would you assemble a complete pencil test of the whole seven or eight? Never. No, we 
just see them in individual loops. So you never saw them all no. joined up together? Never. First time you'd see it together was in the uh, final cutting reel, you know, all on the main camera. You would get it back silent and put it together so before we did the music and sound effects. What was the function of a film editor in a, in a Well, a film, somebody asked that the other night, says, what's a, what's a, you're just putting it together, yeah. yeah. But of course, it wasn't, with sound pictures, it wasn't just the picture. It was the music and the sound effects, and he would be the one that recorded the sound effects with us. Um, we'd go to special sessions. Some came from stock. Sometimes we'd go and have a special session to do sound effects you couldn't get otherwise. And uh, and he would be at all the recording sessions and keeping track, you know, of, and at the music sessions. So he played a very important role. Uh, Trey Brown, I, I visited him recently at his retirement home, and uh, he was just great on that. He was a musician to begin with, and he had that sense of... Did you assign particular tasks to particular animators because on the basis of their skills, like one guy was particularly good at being Daffy or something like that? We never, we never really could, uh, as we talked the other night, uh, we couldn't just say, okay, this guy's good in Daffy, so he gets Daffy throughout the picture. There were too many scenes of the main character, so it was never that case. But as I told the fellows at Leech the other night, what, what we do is we would... When I took a storyboard and I started thinking, now, who, who do I give which scene to? I would start first with the, the least experienced animator and say, oh, my God, what can I give him now here so he won't mouse up the rest of it and choose the little, you know, the little uh, run-throughs and the little this and the that and, and say, okay, that takes care of him for the picture. Then you would go to your best animators, and, and if one animator was better at underplayed acting on the character, I would spot those spots for him. Uh, for the more exaggerated things, I would give it to like a Rod Scribner and several other guys that that uh, lent, lent themselves more to that. So you would cast it definitely, so that you give them the best thing for themselves. You see, but it wouldn't just be one character. Or... Yes. Maybe uh, since it's Warner Brothers cartoons on television, their uh, color prints of cartoons originally made in black and white. Right. Must be they don't retrace the whole cartoon. They they leave things out, unfortunately. Yeah, the animation seems poorer. Yes. When it's in color, do they wrote a scope? They take uh, that's done in the Orient, and they 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 project it frame by frame on a smaller size cell. It's maybe a cell this size. And if you notice on the Porky Pigs, they always have something real funny under his snoot, an extra line. You know, you look at it and say, "My God!" Or they'll things will chatter. They'll leave out drawings or somebody will be walking on a pan and the pan's going by and then he turns and the pan doesn't. And all sorts of bad mistakes. Poorly drawn and you see the original animation in black and white against what they've colored and except for the value of seeing colors it, it, you lose so much. So much. Is it just the television demand color? Uh, Warners uh, sent the ones they owned over there and figured they could sell them better in color. They didn't care much really how... Uh, yeah. Yes, they own the Looney Tunes, the black and white Looney Tunes, uh, in, from, in the first whole number of years, and then they own the post 48, 1948 films. United Artists now owns the, all the cartoons from 1930 to 1948. I thought that there any of them that are in public domain? Yes. Some were never registered, and some have uh, not been renewed. I was amazed at the fineness of the line in the series of Bugs Bunny sounds you had in the exhibit. Yes. Uh, what did your ink and your tracing people use for uh, Those were pens. They just happened to be that fine line on the pen. Was that, was that the standard? Uh, were the lines that Re- Very much. So. You'll see a majority of the cells that I have from those days look about like that. Did they use brush? Uh, tracing with brush? Outline? No, 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 not then. That came later. Started in television commercials for the most part. Fine pen, yeah. They were, uh, uh, you know, pens that stuck on. Yeah. Did you have to keep dipping? Yeah, keep dipping into an India ink, which very much like out of the inkwell type of ink, yeah. except that it had this uh, mixture in it, like the glycerin or whatever, that made it stick to the slickness of the cell. 
was the uh, procedure for like, unsolicited ideas or concepts? For example, if someone on the outside thinks they have a fabulous idea, but they're not informed by the customers yes. they want to take it. Do some animation houses have the departments that they, they go through the motions of talking to people from the outside, but they won't accept it from you unless you go through an authorized agent. Because they, so many ideas come in the mail, and it might be, they say maybe it'll be something close to what we did or are doing, and then we'll be sued. So they only do it through agents, you see. That, uh, literary agents or agents, that's kind of unfortunate. So I think you, you have to take your ideas to agent. Yes, but you've got an agent already, Ms. Bloom, so you can No, I don't mean for myself. I yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're way ahead of the game. <laughs> Anybody care for some of this? I got I'm drinking the whole bottle of 7-Up. Oh. Yeah. Excuse me. There was a, one thing always bothered me. This is a very technical question. What's a foo? A foo? You don't know what a foo is? No, I don't know. It's a very, very risque word. Yeah. No, I, I, I'll tell you what it is. It's uh, Bill Holman used to do a comic strip called Smoky Stover, in which he used a lot of uh, little signs all over the thing and so forth. It was pretty funny. That's what it was in Porky Whack, and I think it was Hello, Boo Boo, or something. No, that was Bobo, Bobo Cannon, our animator. Oh. Hello, <laughs> Bobo. Yeah. yeah. So we would stick people's names in like that. Uh, like Bobo, he was a unusual, he was a short gentleman, and we would of course caricature him about being that tall. You see, <laughs> so everything was cute with Bobo. We always hello Bobo. So all that madness and that scene, there actual people stuck in. Well, Bobo was the only one that was stuck in there, except <clears throat> I also did a, a takeoff on Al Jolson, who used to sing down oh, on one yeah. knee. So, mammy, 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 mammy. That was the second guy, and. Uh, there were the three, a little reference to the three stooges in the three-headed creature, but the rest were just more of imaginary characters. Huh? So what is foo? No, Bill Holman used to have the word foo in his strip. Nobody knew what it meant. See, but, but it was very current at the time. That's why I put it in there. Was foo? Uh, no, it was part of the wagon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you thought everything was really like that? Up yeah, well, <laughs> that's why you're here today. <laughs> well, it, they would say somebody's a foo, you know, which could be fool or it's like, say, off fooey or, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> the Hempic Duck, uh, Daffy at one point said, uh, if only major somebody could see me now. Yes. Ma uh, there was a big radio, national radio program called Major Bowles Amateur Hour in which he would choose people from the audience, supposedly, and they'd have their chance for stardom, you see. So was it when he was doing his magic act? Yeah. Yeah, so... But also, the, the screen, sort of, at that point, uh, got smaller, and he sort of... And he stepped out of, out of the screen, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't they always, uh... <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> no, what was that? It, it was meant to uh, be him saying, you know, here I am, you know. Yeah. Like that. That yeah. <laughs> Yes. No, we, we, uh, Max Fleischer was a great brain for, you know, inventions and things like the rotoscope originally, and, and he had this thing, he, this was his fun, was to construct a thing like that, uh, big swinging thing that moved and, and made the miniature sets on. We found that we got a comparable effect, not as good, but we got a comparable effect by putting things right together close, or maybe building up a, a pane of glass this far from the camera stand, and moving things at different speeds, like if you're going along in a car and the horizon stays constant, and then here it moves slower and faster and then faster, you see? So we would time it like that, and, and a lot of times we got a very dimensional effect uh, without going to the expense that he had there. But his effect was really nice. Yeah, Because I said to somebody last night, if you were going around this bottle on his thing, it wasn't like it just went across the camera straight, but you would see first around this side of it, and then you'd see around this side, so you really get, get dimension, yeah. Did you do much testing of effects like that, pulling the glass? Uh... No, we'd, we'd shoot them right for the production. We had no time for tests. 
I won't say that we didn't on occasion, rare occasion, you know. How come you leech guys aren't asking questions? <laughs> Taking it. Keeping it under your hat, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's hard to get uh, one more, one last joke that's say better than all of them. Yeah, it's very hard. No, no. That'd be an ideal way to do it, but you don't do that. Well, you know, say like Chaplin and Disney took the easy way out on their shorts. They would go from maybe funny slapstick, but at the end it was always some sort of a little warm scene, you know, a cuddle. <laughs> See, that was, uh, you know, <laughs> that was kind of a uh, easy out. Uh, Leon Schlesinger's had this, as I've mentioned recently, he had a sense of theater in a vaudeville. In his early days, he was actually a booker of acts on vaudeville, and he, and he had sort of a vaudeville sense, even though he wasn't an artist or writer or a cartoonist. And he would more or less inspire us to give that vaudeville flavor to it. You know, the opening titles, you know, real fast tempo, wake, wake the audience up, as Hugh Hartman said, we want to wake the audience up. Uh, or, at the end, he would always say to us, you know, come to the end and then have one good laugh, you know, one good laugh and then, whoop, you know, close the iris and, uh, and and go again, you see. So we tried for that and a lot of times we, we just couldn't get that good an ending. But a lot of times. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you just tried your best, that's all you could do. <laughs> well, there'd be occasion where a story might come from that one basic situation or gag. Sure, I couldn't tell you right off which it is, but I'm sure you're right. Yeah. <coughs> I read recently that you wrote the uh, titles and for an entire year's worth of meeting of Cecil over a weekend. By a necessity. Well, no, it wasn't a network. It's a United Arts offered a contract to finance the Beanie and Cecil cartoons. So we went back to New York, made the deal. They were drawing the contract up, and then they, I got home, and they called us up, and they said, before we can sign the contract, we must have the titles and storylines and names of the characters for all 104 or whatever it was cartoons. And, and we need it by the beginning of early next week. So what are you going to say to United Artists? Forget it. No, I'll be back to you in three months. So, so I sat down, as my wife will tell you, and she typed. And I wrote the whole schmear uh, in one weekend, you see, and, and had it there in time, and the contract went through. And did you actually, were those actually the 104 cards? Yes, and, and uh, with only maybe a couple or three exceptions. Uh, as it was, we only made 78. But the 78, went, went, then when we went into production, I actually just would get out those okayed uh, titles and uh, outlines and the character's name and and work from that, you know, with the, with the storyboard guys. We had to do that. And I always said that, uh, you know, if we'd have only been able to not be held to that, it would have been much, we could have done much better, you see. Yes? <laughs> yeah, but then when you work on it a year, getting it all finished, you know, you wish you could have maybe put some different things in. It had its advantages. <laughs> you, you. Uh, yes. We had no blocks or wedges. No blocks or wedges. We didn't know about that yet. <laughs> huh? Pardon? It's a great idea. We didn't think of that. For that Mars series, Bob, were you basically working almost in a vacuum because the in a way because nobody else had done that sort of real life animation before and, uh, and uh, 
you have the ultimate reference and having it for working with you on it. Did you basically work as a from a vacuum or did you uh, did you look at anything that you were in comics at that time? So much of Oh, you mean as far as uh, as far as the sketching of the characters, and still, of course, uh, we had a lot to refer to there. What I really meant was we had no reference point as to animating human figures on the screen. Mm -hmm. You see, but actually, we had Al, uh, not Al St. John, but uh, St. John's illustrations in the Mars books themselves, and uh, uh, there were many things sure to refer to, of course. But, but it's one thing to draw it and still and another thing to make it believable because MGM really, I think they thought at the beginning that we couldn't do that. We couldn't animate the characters in a way that it would be believable to the audience, you see. So that's, that was all we had to really concentrate in there. Now, the story ideas that I already had worked out based on his things were very imaginative, you know, uh, uh, with all these wonderful things, sights and types of creatures and incidents, you know, would have been very rich. You don't see that in the, in the little test because the test was more just to prove uh, the one thing that they, they, they didn't doubt we could do all that. They just doubted could we move the figures so it wasn't just some sort of a stiff, unbelievable thing, you see. Do you think there would be still a market for that sort of thing today? Well, I'm sure there is, but to me the excitement was to, to be going to do that when it had never been done. Mm -hmm. It was virgin territory. It's like discovering America in a little galleon, you know. Now that you've seen all this other stuff, good and bad, and, and things, to me it isn't that. Uh, I'd much rather do something new again that hadn't been, uh, you haven't seen them chewed up and chewed over and spit out, you know. That's what I feel like. What would you like to do right now? Go home and have a nap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, we're going to have this show... Uh, 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 it, it, maybe we take just about... Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three.
<laughs> uh, but we're involved with planning on other things, and we're uh, there's a, one large company there that wants us to help them set up on a new production, animated production. Really? Yes, it's a live action. So we have a, a, a lot of things happening. So great, great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the um, but I, I, I'm really interested that you're in your in seeing your procedures now. I don't suppose, in other words, uh, with what you're doing now, with uh, your, your feature and all this stuff, uh, yeah. uh, if there was other uh, other films, you know, would you would you really be able to take time to, to do some other things? If there was some? Well, we want to do other things because it takes so long and it's so unpredictable trying to you know negotiate and raise the money for the next production. And if we have something that would it would come in on a regular basis. That would be then you something still, that we're then actually you looking for. Do those over a little longer period? Yeah, right. Yeah. Like Richard Williams has been making that the feature of his now between things for some time. You know, oh, really? Yeah. 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 I, I didn't know what he was doing. <coughs> That's a pretty. He does a lot story. of commercials and that sort of thing. We've never done commercials. We've never gone after them at all. Yes. Um, I get a, uh, and I will get an invitation to bid on one from time to time, and. Uh, well, as, 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 as Judith knows, we'll, we'll submit the bid, but I, I've begun to realize that it's just a token thing, that yeah. they know Lee Trankin doesn't do commercials, they just want to hear what they have to say. And yes. How much, yeah. Right. And we seldom even hear back, you know. Here's the other one. Yeah. <coughs> um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Karen? Yeah. Um, Bob Clanton? And... Uh, Sorry, I'm going to Oh, Yeah, that's great. Friday night, we're going to run some Phoenix's over at the Feast of Hope. We were on this television show he got us on this morning, and the guy insisted on calling it the Animal Festival. <laughs> <laughs> for us in the yeah. morning and right. something else at five, you know, and I felt like I'd been hit in the head. I just didn't, didn't, yeah. didn't bounce at all. Oh, gee. Yeah. <laughs> so it's now it's early, there, early evening. But there was a mention yeah. of your studio on, on our show. Uh, on Toronto today. Huh? I'm not going to tell you. Did you get that call in? I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't come tomorrow, it'll come somewhere sooner or later. Uh, I came up with a good one for a chum interview about Anna Peaceful. Something to the extent that Lee Frank is in the backyard of the DNA. Anybody told you from the phone? Oh, that's great, so she told yeah. John. We gotta have that so we found out that they, they didn't use that part and they erased it. <laughs> <laughs> we had a press release ready and now we gotta do a little uh, rapid, rapid editing on it, anyway, restructure it. Right. You gotta, you know, keep sending out little shots and sure. let the world know what we're doing. Sure. We've been quiet for a while. <coughs> yeah, it's no use laying a golden egg and let anybody know about yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I used to uh, be against uh, publicity from an ethical standpoint, you know, and I later I found have, how uh, foolish that was. Yeah, I have little uh, <coughs> moral. Uh, wars going on sometimes, but hell, if you don't do it, then you just, you know, you just die, that's all, so right. well, you got to do it. <laughs> Try to do it tastefully and truthfully, but 
to get creeps. Then, then it's no fun. Which had no no zooms, no come down at all. It was just you know 
just just like a boards up there. It was sitting up there, and, and, and you pulled a chain like it was an old time toilet chain to, to shoot a frame. You see. Really? And so, so uh, first months I was there, I would come back at night and shoot things on this uh, camera, not really realizing it, its history at that moment. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then that camera that shot the first three years of Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies, then when Leon Schlesinger put us, took us over on the Warner Brother lot in 1933, that camera became the test camera. And we shot all of our pencil tests on that for the rest of the years. That was that same camera. But back to how, how did they get zooms? If, did you ever see uh, the early Mickey Mouse called Plane Crazy? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I haven't seen it. The number two was the third, the, third, uh, the third Mickey. It was actually the uh -huh. second one made silent and ran third. And in there, they had they had a, uh, the plane doing a zoom down, you know, like it was going to hit the ground. And this was when the camera was just on wooden, wooden uh, poles. They, right. had, they had no zoom. Yeah. And what they did was, our Iwerks uh, figured this out. He made a, a background, a large background of the ground. And they put it down on the camera stand. They took the frame. And then Roy Disney was helping shoot camera. And they would just put something out of like paper and books and so forth. And little by little, it would move, move up. up. And they would turn, and would turn into cardboard. And yeah. you had this marvelous spin, which shows, it just gives an example of what you can do. You don't have to have a motor plane camera to no, no, right. get your yeah. ultimate effects. You see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We find ourselves doing things. Yes. Because we have no, no, other, no recourse. We just don't have. So, you, so you'll find yeah. a good way to do it. It's got to be, it's yeah. gotta be some way, somehow. And in a way, what you're talking about, uh, drawing directly on cells and all that, all of that seems quite good, in that you're doing something original and not saying, hey, we have to do it exactly the way they're doing it at Hanna-Barbera and so forth. That's a, a big plus that your, yeah. your pictures have a different look. Yeah. Have a different look. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, how, how, how would you go about it? If, if, if you were starting out, you know, with animated characters, uh, and if you were, how would your studio uh, do what what we do? What what would be your process? Well, I, I would never have thought of doing what you're doing. You see, drawing on cells right. and uh -huh. and then the backgrounds that Barry is making in there, the, the the photograph things from books and the colored Xerox, all that's quite original. And I think that's great that you. But your films will have this uh, different look, and still it's a rich look. It's not just the... I thought, well, maybe if it's just on cells, it's going to have colored paper behind it, it's going to look sort of empty. But then when I see the backgrounds, I see that it's going to be quite rich in, in detail and still uh, very imaginative. And imaginative and use of the color, I think that's wonderful. Because the, the biggest problem, I think, in the studios today is that everything is starting to look alike. If you turn on your television, I don't think you can tell on Saturday morning when you're seeing the Patty Freely Hanna Barbera filmation. If you first just get a flash of it, it all the backgrounds are all done the same way. Like, yeah, very. One uh, pardon? One hand made. Uh, yes. It could all be from the same studio, and of course the animators do move around, but that's not the the reason for that. The, the direction comes from the head creative person. And now on the backgrounds there. They learned it a few years back to make rocks by taking a, a sponge, you know, and, and gray and white paint and, you know, putting it on. It made a nice rock. But now they use this effect all the time or, or they don't even get to that much detail anymore, you see. So I, I think that it's well worth pursuing the way John's doing is, uh, and he told me an interesting thing about your animation, how he will give you the layouts to work with. And then many times you'll come back to maybe a, a better way of doing something that she encourages. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all, all for, for, for that. How, uh, <coughs> how, how would your way contrast with, with our way? Uh, well, uh, in other words, I've worked various ways over the years. I ah, mean, what you, ways? Well, you want me to tell about yeah, how I made yeah, a Warner cartoon? Of, and and you'll, be dis, you'll be disillusioned in this because it's so different than... That's okay. Right. It'll, it'll help illuminate what we're doing. And, yes. You know, give us some ideas. Uh, I, 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 the reason we do it this way is we don't know how to do it any other way. May I do it? May I do it? Oh, wow. Do you need anything like this? No, I just have to move my tail around and see if anybody would rather do an owl like that doing this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Would you use it over here? Yeah. Sure. Let's see if we were to see it.
John said, well, just tell us how you make it more effective. Well, that was a, a unique kind of a situation that was unlike any other studio for the reason that at Disney's, all during the early years, Walt was the only real director. Really? Yes, he was the director on the shorts and up through the first four, five, six features. Then, of course, so? then he got, then Walt got involved in, in outside activities, live action movies, parks, and so forth, and right. so forth. But his directors, uh, Walt Disney director was a very good man, but he was a man whose main thing was to capture what Walt had in mind, if possible, and carry it out. And he didn't, the director didn't originate the stories right. at Disney. In other words, the story department under Walt would originate the stories, yeah. and then the director would come in only at the end. He'd be assigned a story, almost like in feature pictures, where he would come in at the end of the story thing and get the feel of it, and then he would carry it through the layout and planning, and, 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 and did a, a wonderful job, but he didn't have freedom. He was all the time concerned, what does somebody else uh, want, you see? Now, there were other studios, you know, at the time that, that had different systems, different systems that they didn't, uh, the other studios didn't really have a Walt Disney, you know, that type of guy that had such a good story in mind and uh, such a feel for moving things forward in art and so forth. But at Warner's, uh, Leon Schlesinger was a, uh, a man who had a sense of theater to him. He, he'd been a booker for, like, vaudeville acts, you know. His first job was to be the uh, barker. In, a, in, in the early days of movies, they had a, a railroad train. And, and they would, you would go in, buy tickets to sit on the railroad train, and they had movies of the scenery going by. You see, and his first job was to call out what you were seeing on the thing. So he had a certain uh, feeling for the theater. And of course, I say, well, he bought a the lax and, and writing publicity and so forth. But he, he knew he wasn't a writer. He knew he wasn't a cartoonist. He knew he wasn't a director. So he, therefore, his system was very much like, say, Jack Warner's was for the live action pictures, and that was to try to find the directors that he would give full responsibility to. He would, he would uh, hopefully out of all these people, find, hire, or bring up from the ranks a man who he could depend on to think up the story with the help of a gag man and carry it through to the end, and he wouldn't usually see it until the picture was shown to him silent. Yes. Now that kind of freedom turned out uh, wonderful for some of us because when we got the position of having that trust and having the freedom to make what we wanted to try out, we'd make mistakes, we'd make some work, do some things that weren't so good. But when we hit on something good, you see, it, it might be quite original for its time because it wouldn't be just uh, something done by committee. It would be something copied from someplace else, you see. So I, I liked that system. It was, it was good for me because when I first came to harmonizing, I had been a cartoonist, as some of you maybe have. You know, as a young kid, I had people in the paper and so forth. And, and, and I always had the thing, well, if you're going to do a comic strip, where you think up the character, you think up the uh, story, and you draw it, you know? And, and, and I thought, well, when you get to animation, you'll be able to do the same thing. And then when I got there, they said, no, no, you don't do any of that. You just sit over here and you in between, you see. And I said, well, that's all I want to do, you know. So I said, how do you get to where you can get your own idea on the screen? So well, to do that, you have to be a director. So then about the third day, I said, well, that's what i got to be as a director. So it took me a few years to get there. But that was the idea. But fortunately, in the early days, I, I was telling you a lot of things that would lead to your question, John. Uh, in the early days of harmonizing, they didn't have a story department when I started there. And so the first week, as I mentioned earlier, I was able to, to give an animation right away. And then two nights a week, they would call us back. And it was a small group like they had here, John, which is wonderful. So they'd call us back uh, for a gag session on the, on the next picture. So while we're working on the first Mary Mother, they were coming back for story sessions on the second part of the second Mary Mother. And so we would come back after dinner. There was no extra pay. But I always look forward to that because there, little by little, you can get some ideas on the screen. It's in that manner, you know, you weren't a director. So I just kept turning in gag. I kept turning them in. And they, I just had more of a knack for that, more for ideas than, than other fellows were stronger in other things. So when Schlesinger took over from harmonizing three years later, 
He said to me, I understand that you've got a knack for that, for ideas and so forth. So he says, if you'll come with me, I'll give you a chance to, to learn to be a director. Because he was looking for directors. He, he first hired Tom Palmer, who had been a top animator at Disney's in the early days. But Palmer was the, uh, the original director. He hired Jack King, who I was assisting, who was the uh, animator on the Three Little Pigs and so forth. And it originated and hit, animated on the uh, Mutton Jeff cartoons in New York years before. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those. They were really important. So, anyway, this thing of, of where I constantly was going out of my way to turn in ideas to him, sketch up stories, and so forth. There was no extra pay for it, but it paid off. And then at a certain point, <coughs> he made me an assistant director, you know, to be a gag man for the director. And from that, then I got to be a director, you see. Now, to the point you're asking about uh, how I work as a director, and, and, and uh, everybody works so different. Sure. Wouldn't even every director of Warriors wouldn't be this way. Right? But I would usually think up the idea, idea, not because maybe somebody else's idea was as good or better, but just because I understood it better. You know, if I had an idea, I'd be consumed with it, and I, I, I would want to make that picture. <laughs> you see, and I had uh, wonderful guys that worked with me. Hopefully, one of them will be here this weekend for this for John's show. His name is Michael Sassenoff. You might not see his name on those credits, but you might not know so much about him. But he was made maybe my main collaborator during the years that I made the best films of Warriors. And he was a background artist. Where he was just needed to lay out some background artists. But then he was the only guy that took enough interest to help me at night on story. I'd say, I, I'd say, yeah, I wanna, I'm going to be working on story night. So I'll come back and work with you. So uh, eventually, You'll see his name as a, as a, as a writer on, on the cartoons. And hopefully he will be here. And you'll meet him, but he's a very fine artist. So the way I would uh, to work on the stories, I get this idea, and I think of all these ideas with Mike Self or whoever worked with me, or whoever, think up all the ideas, and then you, then you make, of course, the story sketches. The way we did was we made these little story sketches on the board. Now, when I look back at those sketches, now, to me, to me, when I got a final storyboard, the whole thing was there in my mind. But now I look back at them, and it wasn't there on the board. You know, they were guideposts, you see. And I, in many times interviews, I'd say, no, we had this storyboard where every little thing was worked out. But it's not there in the sketches, you see. Yeah. It's like a funny thing when you go from here to here. But what I would find is that, that in thinking out the character's actions, I would do that at night. As we were going along in a story, I, would, I lived at the oceanfront. In, in Southern California, yeah, I would take long walks along the ocean at night, you know, with the wind blowing this dark, and I would act out as I walked along because there was nobody looking at you. I would act out these stories, and mentally you would find, well, gee, uh, on the storyboard you know, well, gee, the character goes from here, and he does this, and he does that. But then when you start thinking out the action, it's not, it's not there, you know. So you say, yeah, but there's a gap here. How does he get from here to here? And then you would always try to think up a little original ways of doing that, little original walks, or, and not so that it was just the standard thing. See, we always tried to make our stories unpredictable, things that right. would be little surprises and so forth. Yeah. So in doing that, and working over a period of weeks and weeks on a story, and getting it polished down in your mind, then when you went to, to uh, and you'd write the dialogue, and, and by that time, you, you would hear those voices. In most cases, you would know just how you wanted that to sound. And now when you call in Mel Blank, he would never be at our story meetings. He would meet us over, we could call him and say, hey, Mel, we're going to record now on Monday. And he would meet us over at the sound stage. Is that for me? Sure. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm already frothing at the mouth. And there's no <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so when you would go to the sound stage, that would be the first time that Mel would see the script, see the dialogue. Uh, and naturally, he wouldn't know the little nuances, you know, the little pause when Bugs Bunny was talking, and you have a little pause because you know in the storyboard what the action's going to be. So he would have read-throughs with Mel and other fine voice people who were using, but then he would have to give them that direction, you see, on those, on a, a shading. Many times when we get up at the, I would stand up at the microphone with Mel, 
have both of us with script. And he would say, well now, what's the timing on this? So I would say the line in front of him. And of course he would do it much better, but he would therefore parrot the timing yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you see? So he'd get the feeling of pacing from you and just yes. you know, do it right. And, and then if something uh, wasn't the way we wanted it to be, then I'd explain to you, try it this way and so forth. So we would get our recording that way. See? Right. <coughs> then, then I would take the storyboard into, like Carl Stallings, who was a wonderful musician. He had started in Kansas City with Disney, you'll see it in our show, playing uh, movies, you know, playing the piano or the organ in the pit. So he, he, he had this great knack for uh, that. And when Walt was back there working at film ads, he'd bring these little animated things down to the theater and after the show, and Carl would put music to them. And a few years later, Carl's the musical director of the first Mickey Mouse, and so he put them, you see, but they had that great background in theater. And uh, so here was Carl Stallings, and, and I would take my storyboard into his room and uh, act it out for him, go through the thing from start to finish. And so he, uh, so he for the first time, saw the feeling of the story, what was funny and what happened and so forth. Then I would go back, he would say, well, tell me more, and I would go back through and give him the change in mood, like we wanted it softer quality here and then we break out of that and we do this or this is heavier music and, and then once he started doing it he would make suggestions he said yeah and he would look at the thing and he would say how about this and he'd, he'd play a little tune for you he'd say hey that's just right for that you know and then we'd mark it on the board and say and we'd put down the tempo two eights or whatever and then we'd do it so then we'd play it and we'd do it sometimes we'd play it and we'd say well maybe what we needed there was more of this and then he'd say oh well maybe something more like this and then maybe by trying three or four things that we'd arrive at it to say now we would not always get every inch of film preset that way but we would set with Carl at the piano we would set the temples and write them on the storyboards the temples of each sequence or each change of sequence which I don't know I mean, guys a lot of things I tell you just what you, you maybe do it Similar, but yeah. not not the same. That's not the same at all. It's a very interesting. Yeah. Did you have people like Stallings and uh, Mel Lang and so on on staff at all times? Were they available to you at any time?
in which we had a couple of uh, tramps who uh, get into a bull suit and, and then they reach out and get a bottle of hooch, you might have seen it, but, uh, and they drink, they start hiccuping. You see, and that's what we had in the story. So Mel did all these voices that he had done up in radio in, in uh, Portland or wherever it was. And, and so, they, you know, they weren't anything that you know now. They weren't any of the character voices you know now. They were good, but they weren't anything that we saw media use for. But the one thing that he did uh, was that he did these uh, uh, one little thing of hiccups. They had really good, juicy, bouncy hiccups. So then at the same time, there was another thing happening. You see, we had a fellow from the time we started working big, we had a fellow that did the voice that actually stuttered. His name was Joe Doherty. And uh, there was criticism from the PTA about the stuttering voice, but really Joe was more of a stammer. You know, he really stammered. Mm -hmm. He couldn't help it. He had to do it. Whereas uh, for our comedy effects, it didn't, wasn't quite right. In other words, we wanted to do little twist jokes and things. So we said to Mel two things. The one is after the meeting, I said, hey, we got a thing with stuff with the uh, hiccups in it. Maybe we can do the hiccups for it, you see. And then Drake Brown and I and this other fella also talked to him about the uh, about the porky voice. Could he match the porky voice? And we ended up giving him the disc to take home and listen to. And, and uh, so he first initially just tried to match it so he wouldn't notice a change. And then, of course, he did it much better. So that's the way Mel came into the picture. But then his idea was, Look, at, I, I, I'll do this for my side money, you know, just to keep going. But I want to spend my time trying to get into radio. So he never was at the studio as such. He was on call. He'd be around doing radio shows and promoting. Him. But what, anytime we needed him, as many times of the year as we needed him, that he would come meet us over, not in Hollywood where the studio was, but over at the Warner Burbank studio where we did our recording. So that's the way it worked. Yeah. I love that idea of those uh, story sessions like that because uh, now we already have our voices down. They're, they're, they've been done. And uh, uh, the, the way we operate, we haven't been able, we, we can't afford to keep people on staff when, you know, while we're recording because there's nothing for them to animate. So we have to get the voices down first. So that we're limited to that extent. But now, especially the way uh, some of the guys are interpreting the scenes, I'd like to see us have. Uh, yeah, this is the first time I think we've actually sat down. It's, it's so much been, you know, just moving here in two weeks, you know, it, it's been kind of hectic. But I would like to have sessions like that where we can throw a scene on the floor and uh, would you, see would what you we do that? Oh, yeah, that would be, that'd be <laughs> great, wouldn't I? Sure, yeah, I'd love it. Yeah. Now, maybe somebody, I, I don't think she'd want to come to the story session. You let her go home. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I saw the expression in the face like, oh my God. <laughs> Yan Yanina knows how to take a complicated animation concept and make it work technically. Wonderful. And just unbelievable. Yes. We were working on a crowd scene on the last production, and I think if, if we had done it our way, it would have taken us two months and it would have totaled up to about 50,000 people, you know, that, you know, if you added up all of itself. And uh, uh, Yanina sort of synthesized the movement and the requirements and we made it into layers and uh, there was our crowd scene, it was, you know, done in about two weeks. Thank you very much, Ron. but I work in so long time in animation. You know? Sure, but this is where she's so valuable. And but you know who made... To come to a story session, maybe that's not necessary. She just deal with the problems that we create right, for her. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, first time it's done a big studio in Moscow. It was 40 or 45 years ago. They ordered some, it was some lady from Disney studio. I don't know her name. And she made an order exactly. And until today, it's working. Is that exactly right? Exactly like studios from yeah. Disney. Uh, yes, right. same order. Like, uh, it's like big factory. Yeah. Yes. Drawings, inking, uh, pencil test, and painting, uh, st story department, uh, yes. and plus checking department, like Russian government. Uh, <laughs> 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 Extra. <laughs> right. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, and so, in a way, 
maybe Yanina will begin to influence us. I can understand your it's, it's sort of full circle as some of our Canadian guys go down to California and work down there. You know, the influence yes. started off at Disney World. Yeah. Halfway around the way world around. and back to Canada yeah. and back yeah. again. And they've, yeah. I still have explained you many things which I know. <laughs> and I didn't explain to you. Yeah, right. It yeah. wasn't time. Yeah. But uh, as you okay. say, uh, really, it's not necessary. The people that should be in a story should not be the person that has to worry about the, the about the production because you guys say, "Oh, right. geez, don't, oh my God, no, don't do that," you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at the, at the story session, it should be where you feel free to say well, the silliest think. thing in the world, yeah, right. even if you yeah. look ridiculous. You say it, get it out, and yeah. it might lead to something else. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I remember my feeling when I came to first in the production. I looked to you and I thought, how these people can work in a terrible orbit where everything sneaks like yeah. <laughs> can be a yeah. <laughs> disorder. <laughs> <laughs> like someone threw some fat, another took it. <laughs> yeah. 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 All mixed up. Oh, you know. <laughs> we, uh, organization has never been a, my, my forte. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I need you know, sure. to keep things under control. Uh, this production is very different in feeling, but we've only been going two weeks. It's too soon to say. But uh, uh, I've never had anything start off with such promise. You, you talked about um, how you had the opportunity, even before being able to become a director, to get some input into what was going on. Yes. And, of course, you jumped at it. And I'm sure there are lots of people who would, um, naturally here and down there in California. Today, in the studios down there, are they getting any opportunity to do Very that? Very well. No, it's, it's, it's like the chart now. Like, you know, this is the story department and you know, the person that's in animation doesn't have that chance for it. Now, that is no good. That, that, that is a shame. You have that possibility here because you're not yet a giant factory. Yeah. I've got letters from uh, kids who've gone down to California to work down there, and uh, we've got letters from them begging to come back and work yes. for us at much less salary. Yes. I, I wondered about would, that. Would like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They would like it, yeah. Because, uh, you know, I said to John, your friend John, Rick Lucy, you know, uh, how do you like filmation, you know? Uh, you know? Well, that's not filmation. I'm sure you don't say that when you go out of here. How do you like it? Yeah, totally chill, right? <laughs> you know? What do you say? Oh, boy. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can see some guys that should be in here tonight. Sure. Oh, yeah. And yeah. You feel more a part of it. You feel a part of it. Too. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. Yeah. In the early days at Disney's, uh, uh, they used to do that same thing. Have the, they go to Walt's house and, and they have a jar of the jelly beans, I think it was, in the middle of the table, and they'd sit around the table and they'd think up the stories. She said that was before, again, before there were story departments or again, you know. And, uh, before speed and LSD. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jelly beans. Yeah. 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 Now it's beans, but not jelly beans. You know, on my, on my university tours, and, and trying to make me think of it, that so many times they will say to me, did you ever have anything to do with Fantasia? And I say, well, not, no, not really, but I used to go over and see the pencil tests and, and saw the statues being made, you know, the, the alligators and the and all that stuff. So I was around there and I remarked about the pencil tests, how uh, some of the things that were all in the you had line drawing, I mean, a lot of sketch lines and so forth. And the thing just was alive on the screen. And when you saw the thing he painted, uh, you lost that. Yeah. So when Xerox came in, came in I thought, well, gee, that's going to be good because it'll capture that sketchy drawing, but then right. of course what they do now is they, 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 they clean, clean it all they clean it up before they draw it. So you yeah. don't get the damage. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're drawing on cells, those sketch lines are in there. So yes, don't, can't be. don't make it so clean. <coughs> get filthy. <laughs> 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 your first production looks fresh. <coughs> well, that's right. Because you yeah. see some sketchy yeah. style, not the red line, you know, like doing very professional inking people yeah. on the right. it's yeah. yeah. The, the first production, I, I, I did all the animation in it, 
a half hour show because I didn't realize there was so much work involved. <laughs> and we didn't have any money and so on. So I, I just I just drew it all myself. I, I didn't know any better in a way. You know? And I used frosted cells. So we could only use, I couldn't use layers that way because it just went foggy. Yes. And I drew with pencil on the frosted cell and they painted the back of it and that was it. You know, I had a couple of painters. And um, but it's, I just, you know, drawing very, very fast. I did 15,000 drawings in the four months, you know. And, um, but and I'm always a little ashamed of it because it looks, yeah, it isn't, you know, polished and everything. But when people see it, I get nice responses. It's, uh, it's nice it has it has pretty lame production values, you know. But uh, it's it's fresh and it's got that. Uh, well, you guys saw it the other day, and the drawings are bad, but they're alive, you know. Yeah. And this and people get the lost them. in that. And the next night out, they That's right. The and, and we just night out. We, 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 got, we were more professional, and we got better advice, and we got professionals working for us with a bigger budget, and everybody knew that you always work it out on paper first, and you do it on the cell, make it all clean. And I, I had to admit it looked slicker, but it lost uh, the sense. And another thing, too. Uh, and this is really, you know, I, please, I don't forget what he just said. That's the most valuable thing, you know. It's just... Magic. I'm glad yeah. somebody mentioned, uh, you mentioned something that made me mention Fantasia, and I was getting to another point, which I'll get back to in a minute. But, uh, speaking about the light and, and using, uh, it can be used to not just be that it's rough drawings, but to be used to give an effect of uh, movement and so forth. In other words, you can make use of those rough lights to further the, uh, the movement sure. rather than yeah. just saying, well, it's a technique, you see. Yeah, right. It can be used in yeah. right spots to do that. Yeah. But back to, to the Fantasia thing, at the university uh, lectures that I give, they say, hey, you were there, you know the people working on Fantasia, right. Then they very hopefully say to me, you know, what were they on? Say, mm -hmm. you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, were they on this or that? Yeah. And I say, I, I hate to disappoint you, but yeah. it was pure uh, inspiration. It was pure, yeah. Uh, right. yeah. <laughs> they ask me that about you every time I show black in <laughs>
and then take it from there. He says, well, look, if you can do that with people, why can't you do it with, with drawings? You see? And so they got that idea, and they started working on it actually before Disney started on Steamboat Willie. And they didn't finish it until after, but they took uh, uh, Max Maxwell, who I knew in the studio, who was the voice of Bosco on it, and they put him in blackface, you see, and, and as they recorded the dialogue, they actually filmed it, because they thought they had to get those lips exactly right, you see. And so when they animated it, they animated right to the, the film of him uh, speaking the line. And it's very crude now, but it's uh, got a lot of vitality to it, and you'll see it's got in that. It's uh, pretty interesting. They took that from the lessons here was in the title business. We took it from Warriors, and that's how we can start it. Tell us what you did about the uh, <coughs> Charlie the Carpenter puppet doll, puppet animation. Would that be of interest to a lot of It might not be of interest to what they're doing now, but in terms of the future, if you ever get any puppet animation, it would be really interesting to know. Uh, uh, Reg, what particular thing you mentioned? Uh, the walking, the walking puppet. The walking ball there. Oh, yeah. Well, it's an amazing piece of film because it's, you know, Charlie McCarthy. It is the actual puppet. The it's actual figure, yes. Yeah, it isn't a drawing. It isn't a yeah. drawing. Uh, the idea I had at the time was Edgar Berg and Charlie Carson were big. Have you ever seen them or heard of them? Yeah. 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 Well, they were tremendous uh, successes on radio. Yeah. You know, on the ventriloquist act on radio. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and then they had made a few shorts of Warner's by the Bone Shorts, you see. And, uh, but they were all, you know, it would be like, Charlie and Edgar at the races, you know, and they're just behind a pole, and there's no movement to it, you see. And so my idea was to make a series of puppet shorts, or a series of shorts of Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Sturt, but give them the freedom of where not only could they do this good close-up stuff, you know, the good personality of the dummy, or the real dummy, but have the duplicate, which is essentially made like a King Kong is made, in other words, where you have your uh, ball bearing armature inside of it so that, so that the character you can make it move and hold it in any position. Right. See, I still have that dummy at, uh, at, the, at the studio and uh, from, this was oh my uh, 1938, 30 long, about 38, and I, I set up this puppet studio across the street from Warriors and, I, and, and Al Kendig, who was a quirky in-betweener with me and I, he was a sculptor and we invented a system Basically, the system was a, a means of animating, animating the figure and matching it up to the uh, dummy. And therefore, we got, uh, we were able to get the precision of animation in the in the puppet, which goes way beyond a normal thing where you just guess at it. Yeah. Know. And so we shot this. Then we were going to cut close-ups of the Charlie and or whatever, uh, and go back and forth, you see, and. Uh, so we made this thing, and then I, I was under contract exclusive to Leon, so if we could only do it, it'd be acceptable. And as it was, he said, well, we're looking at 40 cartoons a year, and I, I don't think we should take our time to be doing puppets. Ah. But it, it was, as Red said, we will show us a part of that footage or some, something somewhere Saturday night, and it might be something you might use for it. Let me show you more about it. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the eyes. It's already really got ideas perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, uh, who knows? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm finding myself uh, more and more interested in uh, dramatic entertainment, well, just entertainment as opposed to the medium of it. Even if it requires puppets, then we'll use puppets. And, uh, Whatever it requires, you know, to convey whatever the whatever the thing is, you know, the medium is flexible as anything. One thing I'm not very interested in yet is, is live action. That doesn't seem to uh, move me very much. It's so limited to uh, what's possible. <laughs> animation is just limited by nothing at all. Yeah. The great thing in animation is, as you know, is to do yourself. I have a little space. Exactly what you want it to be. 
can't do that in live action. You got big sets and actors who see everything different. You know, it's not that way. That's that's why I was thinking there's a trend in music and animation. Yes. I was wondering actually why so many of the Warner cartoons have this musical thing. Why so many of the Warner cartoons have what? A musical thing. Yes. Well, a certain number of them, uh, from time to time, we would make what we call a musical cartoon. Of course, we started off being musical cartoons, movie tunes, merry melody. Of course, in the beginning of sound, cartoons, uh, uh, it was that movement to the music and sound effects that was the big hit with the audience. You see, they would see the silent films, and suddenly with that same movement and this great precision and yeah, right, yeah. If that was just sensational, now when you see yes, it, really it wasn't just an accompaniment, it was <coughs> in sync. Yes. Yeah, right. Right, in, in sync, it's just an integral part of the thing. Right. And of course, in the early days of, uh, of talkies, this is kind of an interesting thing, but uh, you'd be too young to know that have seen it, but uh, the silent movie, moving picture, had got a, a great technique. They had moving cameras and, you know, they had a great scope to the silent film. And when talkies came in, suddenly the live action films were all nailed down where people were trying to talk in the microphones that were hidden in bases, you see. No. It was, you see, and so the whole thing, for the most part, became very static and, and, and lacking the movement of the, the, the cinema technique. Now, it was at this minute, moment, that Disney comes out with the first synchronized sound cartoons, you see, in which everything was moving all, all around that screen. But not just moving, it was with great precision and, and to the sound of the music. And, and, and it made everything else look like it was standing still, you see. So at that moment, the cartoon was just was way past live action for the most part. When I first got into television, uh, I ran into a similar situation. And Walt said to me, he says, you know, your being a puppet show, in a way, has the same kind of impact that my first movies had. Well, it was almost the same thing because television that was on little stages for the most part, indoors, and they didn't, they didn't have backdrops, they didn't have the scope, and suddenly with the puppets, people were doing cartoon movements and cartoon actions, and the effect on the screen was you know, that same great uh, difference, you see. But uh, I didn't mean to divert there, what were we talking about, John? Uh, we were getting to the point. Yeah, we had a number of things going yeah. on. <laughs> uh, music and cartoons. Very the music and oh, cartoons came, yes, very, came from very deep. So, you were asking about the musical themes yeah. of picking a, a specific piece of music yeah. right. and creating a cartoon around that. Thank you for getting us back on the track. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was going to say is that originally the Merry Melodies, as so many of you know, the, the Warners only gave the contract for Merry Melodies because Leon said to them, look, you own this big music publishing houses and you have the movie musicals. We, we will make these tunes uh, even more popular and sell more copies and so forth. Oh, because they already own the property. Because they already own those songs. You right. See? So when we make a thing... It all comes down to money. It's a big matter. Yeah. But happily, sometimes the money people's uh, uh, end results coincide with yours. Then yeah. it's fine. Yeah. 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 So here was a case of where they had these songs. So we would constantly, as we, uh, we would, every time somebody would record a new song in Warren's for a musical, Maybe a day or so later, we would have the sheet music copy there, and our musician would play it. So it was like Tin Pan Alley, where you were, you know, here was all these new songs being played. And then you would say, oh, now that, we could do a story around that one, or we could use that in here. So a lot of tunes that are real popular, that are famous today, uh, I heard the first time when they write off a you know, sheet copy, that, uh, and they were just being prepared for the features, you see. So we made, you know, Lady Play Your Mandolin, Merry Melody Number One. That was a song written by uh, Irving Caesar, who wrote No No Man Man, and also by Oscar Levant. That was written by them. The second, the one which you're running, uh, Rich, in your show, Friday Night, is it? Crosby, Columbo, well, uh, well, that was just, that was also from a song, and, and so also was Smile, Darling, and Smile, which was an old standard. That, that was our second Merry Melody, you see. So we, at the beginning, not only faced the the Mary Melody on a song, but we uh, called it by that title, you see. The title of the cartoon was actually the title of the song. But 
as we as we went along with that, we found that the necessity of having a singing chorus in every cartoon. I've heard so many times, you know, we maybe have a story concept and then we stop to do a singing chorus. It didn't make sense. Right. So we fought our way clear of that. And then of course the movie musicals also were petering out so that it, it all came about. So we went back to where we could not have to use music, not have to feature. But then we would get the desire to do a, a musical, whether it's a black musical, an opera, uh, a whatever you say. So sometimes we would do those just because we thought it was an original idea, it wasn't by any particular pattern or designs. Is that what you mean? I just find a lot of a lot of animators are uh, I'm really interested in music. A lot of musicians in the music that's quite interesting to people. Even even sort of avant garde people like Norman McLaren and people like Alexia, you know, they really used to sort of music and music. Right. It's interesting to see. Any other questions or who started out doing cartoons and music? Can you get over there? And then, and then just stop using it. After a while, the magic decision. One of the things about Smile. Yeah, very sweet. One of the things about Smile Darn You Smile that Bob neglected to mention, which is the second Mary Melody, is that he animated a short sequence in that on a streetcar, but the streetcar ads came to life, and that was such a hit in the theaters that it led to a whole string of cartoons with, with soapbox labels coming to life and <coughs> book covers, and climaxed in one that he did called Book Review. Where all these book covers came to life and, and chased Happy Duck. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Right? It, uh, to be exact, I didn't uh, animate the sequence, but that was, uh, you know, we're talking about these story sequences where you, when you're starting out, you come into the story conferences at night, story meetings. Well, the first week I was there, uh, they had the story conference at night in which I suggested that concept. Now, I, 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 uh, when you see the cartoon, you'll see just a short little thing of that thing. I had drawn out a thing with caricatures of all the well-known advertisements, you see. And I did them not as animals, but as human figures. And, and, and the thing at that time is there had been, there had been books, books coming to life before, but there hadn't been the modern, up-to-the-minute satire on the advertisements, you know, all the advertising figures. That you, yeah. you see, that was a thing that was special about it. I, and I wrote, I have a letter to my mother and also to my art teacher about this in which I described the original script that I turned in in detail, which is much more extensive. And when they, 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 they liked the idea, they decided to use it, but when they finally did it, they just laid it out as Smith Brothers and a few things, as animals. And it was shortened down this much. And it didn't compare with the original concept, but in spite of that, it got just the basic idea of it got such a big hit in the theater. The reaction, as, as Rich said, that, that that led us to I mean, the magazines coming to life and, mm -hmm. and all of that, you see. Mm -hmm. So that was very helpful to me because just as a kid, the first, I was 16, I think, and it was a, at the first week I was there, and I, I, I came up with something that the bosses liked and used, and you see, that, that, that was very beneficial. Yeah.